A climate model is trying to solve the Navier-Stokes equations on the rotating sphere. Um, and if you know anything about solving PDs uh, on rotating spheres and you know anything about Navier-Stokes, you'll know that, yes, you can do it and you need a supercomputer, but actually it won't resolve some of the processes you care about. The main one being clouds. So on the sort of grid scales that they can solve climate models, you do not get clouds. So you have a temporal thing solving Navier-Stokes, and then you have what you call a physics package, which is essentially trying to put things like clouds back in using sort of linearized equations inside the grid boxes. So when they do that, um, you introduce a lot of parameters, the parameters that control the behavior and the characteristics of clouds and various other things. Maybe you have hundreds of these parameters and you don't know what they should be. So the emulators that we want to build for climate models are trying to change the parameters of the models, not necessarily the forcing functions, to try to get climates that somehow match the world so that we can then take the model forward itself, running free, to do things about the future. So it's a calibration problem. And they don't just want to, um, they don't want to emulate single numbers, they want spatial fields. So this is, this is stuff from the Canadian model. Actually, the color scale is partially due to Michael. So in 2013, we were at a workshop in Banff together, and he told me off for having colors other than blue, red, and white in my uh, <laughs> spatial picture plots. Never again have I made that mistake. So there we are. So you have temperature over the 2D field. They want that to look about right. So here, this is difference from observation. So white is, in some sense, all right. Blue is too cold. Red is too warm. Um, but you don't just have one of these fields, and these are, these are just for summer. You have many of them, about 20 or 30, that they want to look at at the same time. And some of them are good, and some of them are terrible. This is the top of the atmosphere balance. So in some sense, when you're calibrating, you're going to try and use an emulator to speed up a function that takes about a week or two weeks to run at one time, and you're going to be trying to emulate the spatial output. So input dimensions, 20, 30, 40, 100. Outputs, potentially huge. So spatial fields of circa 10,000 grid boxes times 20 times however many seasons that you're looking at. Now, <clears throat> We've heard a little bit about Bayesian calibration uh, before, and we heard a little bit about history matching. And essentially, the idea is that you say, OK, the climate is, uh, has some contribution from the climate model at its best parameters. And then there's a model discrepancy. You have some observations of the climate. These would normally be partial, so there should probably be an instance matrix in front of Y. You observe those observations with error, and then calibration allows you to infer the posterior distribution of X star. Um, and in the climate tuning literature, there are lots of other auto automatic procedures that sort of put a cost function like a square distance, and then try to optimize. So calibration is an optimization problem. Um, and and I, I'm a fan of the, a thing I'm calling post-optimization. So this shouldn't be an optimization problem. Optimization is a bad idea. And it doesn't take the climate model as long to understand why. But so, for some reason, statisticians are very attached to optimization. And nobody seems to get why. Um, so I'll explain my solution before I explain what's wrong with optimization. Instead of optimization, I think you should say, um, I would like to keep all of the models that are similar enough to the observations. That's what history matching does. Ian mentioned it earlier. I'm going to say a bit more about it. The idea is, instead of optimizing, you produce some norm that looks at the distance between your observations and your model. And then you define a set of your inputs where this norm is small enough and keep all of the inputs that are consistent with that. So I'm going to call that uh, Enroy space. And the reason for saying it in this sort of general idea is because later when we get into how we do this in spatial world, uh, the choice of this norm is sort of a, a research question. But that's not 
as interesting as why I think that we shouldn't be doing optimization. Okay, so why is optimizing a cost function slash calibration, which I think is the same thing, the wrong thing for climate models, and maybe any models, but it depends on, you might have some models where it's a good idea. So, if you try to optimize a state vector with only a handful of data on the state vector, so let's say in climate our state vectors order a billion things, and we have data on like order 100 things, then you are overfitting or overtuning. Now, there are reasons, there are ways that you can do that that might not matter. So you might just try to be inferring what happened in the past. That's fine. In the climate problem, we're going to try to get the best parameters and then run the model forward and learn about the future or infer what happened away from the observations. Well, you don't know many of the things that happened. So in some sense, you push the model to the, the solution that's kind of closest to the observations, even uh, though it may not be a good one. And you can set up all kinds of fun situations where this falls down. Uh, the worst thing for calibration is you need good prior structural error information. I, I could give a whole talk on this paper, um, just copying someone else's talk, which I found to be brilliant. But uh, essentially, if you don't have very structured prior information on discrepancy, then this thing, uh, discrepancy and, and parameters are not identifiable. And so that makes this problem worse. You can get a very good joint simulation of the climate, so you can figure out what's happening, especially at your observations, but you cannot then trust that model into the future. So somehow the model at the parameters is key. Uh, and then finally, and related to number two, is, is what we call in our last paper the terminal case, which is given that you did this, if in some sense you were wrong and the model cannot get close enough to the observations, um, then, well, in a history matching sense, you get this, this space being empty. Okay, that's, uh, that's bad. But if you try to optimize, you get very badly wrong answers. And you won't know that you got badly wrong answers. So you'll take your model off into the future. OK, so the, the climate modelers love this idea. Um, and they have taken our code and run with it. So this, this, these are the French models. There are two models in France, one run by Meteo France and one run in Paris, uh, LMD. And they both go to the IPCC. And then they're also used for weather modeling. And they've taken our code. And essentially what they do is use emulators to map their parameter space. So you're getting spatial fields they're trying to emulate of all of their parameters. Here are some of their parameters. And they're looking at the parts of the space that are in this set. And they try to do it very quickly. So this is an example where, um, so here you have gray, the set is empty. And then these are 2D projections in all of these parameters. So the, 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 the yellow band is mostly in this section. Um, the, the models are inside the good set. So it's saying that this parameter and this parameter need to be in this band in order to find the good region of models. OK, it's interesting. But what they're doing with it is very quickly doing this to test new parameterizations of the climate model. So this A thing was a parameter that they hadn't tried before. They put it, it's a, this is a cloud parameterization. They put this thing in um, to see if it did anything. And over, I think, four iterations where they, they shrink this space iteratively, they found that it just really didn't matter what it was doing so much uh, until you, you drilled down. So it's sort of, A, if you can't, um, if you get to a certain scale, it matters in some sense, uh, but early on, it, it didn't matter so much. And there, I think there are about 10 papers coming out where they've, that different people are tuning different parts of the model in this way. So it's, it's, it's nice because it's safe. You just say, here are all the models consistent with the observations and let them do the physics. Whereas when they, whenever people say, oh, well, what we did was we took the precipitation field and we optimized it, and this is the best set of the parameters. And the head of this model would say, so what does the temperature look like? What does the top of the atmosphere look like? Oh, it looks terrible. That doesn't work. Um, now that they can control it and they can start screening out these things all at once. So that is what 
what we're trying to do, James is going to explain how we do the sort of spatial emulators of, of, uh, of many dimensions. Uh, yeah. So the way that we do this, and the way a lot of other people do it as well, is to use some low dimensional representation of uh, high dimensional spatial output. Um, so one obvious way to do this is to use principal components, SVD. So you explain as much for variability across you know, your ensemble of model runs as possible. And then you project the data onto that, um, which gives you a set of coefficients on each. Um, you truncate after a small number of base vectors once you've explained the majority of variability. And then you just fit univariate Gaussian processes to each of these small number of coefficients. So you've summarized your high dimensional field um, with a very small number of emulators. So it makes the problem a bit more tractable. Um, so, so that's what we do. And I'm gonna, hopefully now going to argue it's both efficient and effective. Um, so kind of the competent approach to this is to build an emulator for every single grid box and do this univariately. Um, so here you'd have for every single uh, sort of pixel in this output, you would build an emulator, ignoring any sort of correlation structure between points. Um, so obviously, well here we have 8,000 grid boxes, so we have obviously 8,000 emulators, whereas the low dimensional basis approach requires something on the order of 10. Um, and obviously when you're doing this for something like a climate model, if you're interested in 20, 25 different spatial fields, then you can't really build 8,000 emulators for every single field, so we save a lot of time with that. And also, when history matching, and once we've done multiple waves, we're getting into small regions of the parameter space, we might need millions of samples from our emulator posteriors. So again, this is much more doable if we've got a small number of emulators. Um, so that's kind of what uh, this plot's trying to compare. So for the basis approach, um, we perhaps have a larger initial cost. We've got to calculate the basis, so do some matrix inversions. Um, so that can be expensive, obviously, as the size of the output field increases. But then we get the benefits later. We only have to build a few emulators, and then we only have to evaluate a few emulators at millions of points in our parameter space. So as we add more posterior samples, our cost doesn't really increase too much. Whereas if we were building an emulator for every single point, well, that's going to take us a lot more time as the dimension increases. And then the number of posterior evaluations of expectations that we need increases exponentially as we want more samples, want to drill down into small regions of the parameter space. And obviously, as the size of the output field increases, then again, we generally don't need much more time with the base method, whereas as the output size increases, we need to build more emulators if we were doing the every grid box approach. Um, so it's efficient. Um, is it effective? Well, um, on the left hand side here is the expectation of a certain x for this um, climate field. And this is the basis method. This is for every grid box method. So here they actually look fairly similar. But obviously, the left hand side one is much faster to get. Um, but this is the, the expectation looks similar, which maybe that's all we need for history matching or calibration. Um, but sometimes we might be interested in actually looking at individual samples from the posterior. So with the base method, since we have the correlations built into our base vectors, samples of the posterior <coughs> actually look physically coherent, whereas since we've ignored any correlations for the univariate approach, unless the posterior variance is very small, we're going to get this sort of patchy um, effect, which clearly isn't an actual realization of the model output. And why might we care about this? Well, in, say, some sort of risk application, say, a flood model or tsunami model where we're interested in the output crossing some threshold. Um, and say we incur some loss, like a uh, seawall is breached if several grid boxes go over a certain um, threshold. Well, if we're univariately sampling from posteriors, then we obviously are gonna underestimate that because they're not linked together, whereas if our boxes are correlated, we should get a much more accurate representation of the actual risk of crossing some threshold. Um, that's kind of what this is trying to show. 
Um, so building in correlations should give us better answers. Um, I've also, I guess it's a bit anecdotal, but I mean, we've generally found that uh, the base methods perform better than uh, building these uh, univariate emulators for every single output, which I guess is because we're putting the correlations, capturing the physicality from the model directly with our basis vectors. Um, but also, we have far fewer emulators to actually um, look at and fit. So we can spend more time fitting good emulators. We can e more easily diagnose where we're going wrong. Um, I have never looked through all 8,000 validation plots for my, the climate emulators. Um, so again, if you spent a lot more time fitting those, maybe you could do as well, but it's perhaps not necessary since we can get fairly accurate emulators with a, um, a small number of base vectors. Um, this is an engineering example. This is a 12,000 dimensional output. Um, this beam, which has five input parameters, which are angles of forces um, acting on it. Um, so obviously this is highly physical correlated. So we can actually capture this 12,000 dimensional output space extremely well with only two basis vectors due to the fact only certain things can happen. Um, so again, this is a good reason to use this sort of method and why we wouldn't want to do everything individually. And again, this is actually part of a much bigger problem that has millions or billions of outputs. So again, if we can summarize this part of it with only two emulators, then that's nice. That's a good saving. Um, so obviously things could go wrong, so I'm going to quickly talk about the case where our basis doesn't uh, properly represent what we're interested in, which is the observations, and Danny's going to quickly talk about kernel PCA, which is about misalignment of patterns. Um, so with the basis um, emulation case, we can easily diagnose whether we're in this terminal case where uh, the subspace that we've defined um, within our high dimensional space doesn't actually contain uh, the true observations that we're actually looking for. So therefore, we can guarantee before we've done anything that we will conclude that the model cannot produce the observations. Um, but we, might, we wouldn't know whether that's actually true or not. We've guaranteed it. So this is a toy example set up to demonstrate that. So the observations, which can be produced by a certain setting of the input parameters, have this main diagonal. Uh, the majority of the model output is biased. And the question is, well, can we identify the true best estimate of parameters in this setting? And it turns out if you use the SVD basis, then you can't, um, because the leading vectors of that don't contain the directions of variability that we're interested in. And we basic, our representation of the observations actually looks like this. So we've kind of lost the main structure that we had in the observations, even with perfect emulation. Like this is the best that we can expect to do. So then we would conclude that, well, our model can actually not produce this, but we'd be wrong. Um, so how do we fix this? Um, so we came up with a way of combining low order eigenvalue, eigenvectors um, with the lean directions of variability to basically perform a rotation on this low dimensional space, which then does allow us to search in the directions that we're interested in, which is trying to go towards the observations. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip over that. So there's a lot more details in the paper. We prove some stuff and show how to do this. Um, essentially, what this does is reduces basically the error between the observations and our representation of the observations on the basis. Um, and we trade off uh, this blue line, which is the amount of variability explained by these basis vectors. But we can then represent what we actually want, the observations, much better. Um, and in this example, it turns out that well, the patterns we're interested in were hidden away in low eigenvalue eigenvectors, so we can actually, by doing this rotation, have a basis that allows us to look in the right directions. And then if we then emulate this and history match, so initially we can't actually find stuff that looks exactly like the observations, but we at least search in the right directions, so that then if we do a new wave um, 
or so we sample new runs of our model, then we start to find runs that look a bit more like the observations. And if we repeat this process, then we eventually uh, can calibrate and actually can find X star. And that's probably me. OK, so that approach that James outlined has got us a very long way with climate models. Um, but it doesn't always work. So here's the analogy for why it doesn't work. Who has spotlights in their kitchen? Spotlights in your kitchen. Yeah, I have spotlights. OK, not many people have spotlights. But if you do, you'll know that, that, that they kind of form patterns, a bit like the basis vectors. Now, if you had a dimmer on every one of your spotlights, maybe think of these lights, then that gives you a certain amount of lighting that you can have, right? You can, you can play up and down with these, and you can essentially make the light stronger or weaker. And that's what the rotated PCA does. It sort of finds, it can't move the lights, but it can find a way of turning the knobs in just the right way to mimic patterns, if you can do that by dimming the light. But sometimes when you change the parameters, currents move. They move in the, the 2D space of the output. So that's like your actual lights need to move. So how do we do that? This is Wenji's work. So I'm going to try to give a very rough explanation uh, of what we've done. So we're going to try to use kernel methods on the output space now to, to try to highlight features. And, and so the people in this room know much more about kernel methods than I do. But essentially, what you do is you say, OK, there is some mapping of phi on my f, my model output a mapping into higher dimensions, wherein um, the behavior up here is going to be linear. So I don't need to know the mapping, and I don't need to know the number of dimensions that I'm going in. But what I'm going to do is define a kernel on my outputs in my spatial field that tells me how similar things are. So I can set this up so that currents, as long as the current is there, it doesn't matter where it is. And then that kernel is going to be the dot product, the, L, the L2 in a product, uh, in this special space. And then you know, kernel methods basically allow you to get rid of the fact that you don't know the dimensions or, or anything like that and do lots of things just with this kernel. Um, OK, so that's nice. So what's it kind of doing? Well, when we have our principal component, suppose we're trying to match this observation, and we've got all of these fields to compare it to. And then we rank them by the closest thing. So anytime this pattern overlaps with this one, we get something close. And then when the pattern's there but it doesn't overlap, it's actually further away than this is in L2. I mean, it's kind of just obvious why that should happen. Whereas if you use a better kernel, you can reorder everything so that the pattern is closest. Great. So what are we going to do? Well, um, about 20 years ago, people figured out that you can do PCA in the kernel space. And whilst you can't construct this matrix, you can get these coefficients. And so you can emulate them in the same way that James talked about. And the first emulators for KPCA coefficients came about two years ago. So Wenji's work has to say, OK, well, if we redefine history matching to think about uh, the distance in feature space, uh, then you can, you can bound this and you can work out uh, what its expectation and variance should be so that, in fact, we can f define a new history matching on this feature space by doing the, K the KPCA and having a theoretical bound. So the details are kind of in the slide. Uh, and to show that it works uh, for a toy example, here's a sort of uh, true Enroy space for a function. And when you go through the KPCA, we should have shown the function here, you get emulators that sort of very, the blue dots are showing that the features have separated and the big issue is that our emulators are still quite uncertain, so we need to be better at emulating. But it is finding the right kind of structure, so I have more slides, but there we go. Thank you.